everybody. This is about the story of when my sociopathic husband, ex-husband, uh, told my children that I was dead. Yeah, you heard it right. So uh, if you haven't watched my video on when I went to jail, I'm gonna link it anyways. Uh, listen to that story because this kind of hooks onto that. It, um, I talk about how I was, um, I'd been, you know, basically left, you know, just destitute. And then I had, you know, this kind of breakdown and, and I got arrested for um, forging a prescription for antidepressant medication. I know, it's ridiculous. They're, I mean, like, I'm not kidding you. Like, I say it so many times, but my story is just stranger than fiction. And and there's all these little details that no one's ever known. So, of course, no one's ever known that it was antidepressant medication. All I knew is that I was, that I got, I had arrested for forging a prescription. The jury's in and I am, I am the designated, you know, basket case bad guy in this story. So on the, basically on the heels of my, my divorce and being dumped, subsequently dumped by my boyfriend that was a lawyer that I met, that I met after, after, my, after my husband did the whole setup of getting me arrested, that lawyer that took my case eventually declared his love for me and we started an affair. And, um, and I moved in with him and everything. And then right on the, and he was, you know, total love bomb. It was total love bombing. Like, um, I've been waiting for you my entire life. Um, you're the woman for me. He dumped me just not long after I got divorced, after the divorce was final. And so it was like, boom, boom. And then he, and, and also a part of, part of what the deal was when we were together was he just wanted me to, um, you know, he wanted to, he wanted to buy a house that was going to be our home and he wanted me to move in and you know so I, said, so I was not at all set up for it when he moved when he wanted me out and so um, he moved my sons and, and myself into a motel and of course the ex is still not letting up he's not in compliance with any of the even, even though the divorce was like a runaway I mean it was like a slam dunk for him he got just about every single thing um, he was still not in compliance with it. He was still not in compliance with it. And he was still after me, just still trying. He wanted, he wanted, he wanted the kids. He wanted, he, he just wanted to top me off. He just wanted to, he just wanted to finish me off. And so, um, the kids were the la they were the thing keeping me going. They were the thing I was living for. My family was helping him all the while. Um, I, t I there's another story that I tell in here about, um, about my, my parents um, foreclosing on my house and how, how I had to go to court and how that's actually called the awakening um, how I started finally coming awake when that happened so after after Jackson and I split up and he moved me into the hotel motel um, I was just you know not doing well and freaking out and it was constantly you know under threat and under siege and you know um, and I was, I was really unraveling. At this point, it had been four years of just relentless, relentless attacks and betrayals and, and abandonment. And I was super scared and I was totally broke. And then this, this subsequent um, breakup was just the nails in my coffin. And so I, I really just lost it. And, um, and I, was, I was thinking I was going insane. And, um, and at this point, I don't have any medical insurance. I don't have any money. And so... Um, so I remember, I, I have, I have, I have, um, because of the way that my, that my, my medical care was working in my previous insurance, I got, I had, I saw a nurse practitioner who was overseen by a doctor who wrote the prescriptions for me. And so she would usually have to have them pre-prepared and would have to give me a few at a time. And so the person who actually wrote my prescriptions, I never knew. I never, I wouldn't know him today if I ran right into him. And so, um, a lot of times what would happen is I would leave and there'd be some problem with it, you know, there's something that would be wrong with it, or a couple times he forgot to sign one, or the date was wrong, or something like that. And usually I would get a handful, I would get like three months worth at a time. And so, you know, I had a few of these laying around, I guess, that were eventually, you know, just ones that I couldn't, have, I couldn't use at some point. Oh, I don't know, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just, no, actually I'm pretty new at not having insurance and stuff. I have no money, no insurance. 
But I remembered um, that, you know, a couple of my medications, there was one that was really expensive, but a couple of them weren't. They were really cheap. And so it was just, but it was, you know, it was a matter of getting the prescription. And so, um, so I, I had, what I did, I actually, I had a, an old prescription that was signed, but not dated, right? There was something on it that was, it was an old prescription that I, that I altered somehow. And, or maybe it was, maybe there was, sometimes he would forget to sign them, but I had some other ones that were signed. And so I copied it or something happened, but there was something on it that I altered. And, um, and I did this a couple of times. I got away with it. I got away with it. And, uh, and so then, uh, when I got caught, there were, there were, they went back and there were a few, you know, several charges at the times that I got away with it. So that was what, that was what it was, but it was, uh, psych, you know, psychiatric medication. So that's what I'd been arrested for. And, um, and so I was able to enter into this program for nonviolent offenders, which I talk about that. And I talk about how I, um, how I was, how I, how how I didn't I actually didn't tell this story um, I'll slip this in there how I, when I was in jail I had to have a place to live and, and since I was living in a motel I couldn't I couldn't enter this program living in a motel I had to have a more permanent residence than that and so I called my brother having nowhere else to go and asked him if I could live with him now this is this is a total waving of a white flag. I mean, I have been waving a white flag forever. I've been I've been asking for help for years, and you know they've been just totally merciless. But you know, at this point, I am beaten. I don't know if somehow they can be clueless about how much. And I'm sure that they are because I'm sure that they're listening to my ex, who is not going to ever confess about how he has totally taken advantage of me and how he's totally ripped me off and how he's stolen from me and. And, and our business and how he's just, you know, cooked the books and fixed the records and, you know, used the house as a, a, a place to run money through. And I mean, he, he, you know, and, and, and forged, talk about forgeries. I mean, forged tons of signatures of mine, um, set me up for, you know, debts that I didn't agree to and loan, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, screwed me out of uh, being able to get qualify for disability social security disability coverage because he made it look as though I've been getting paid because he manufactured a bunch of checks with my name on them that I never received that were not real checks I mean just a bunch of really really shady stuff he did and none of that ever what none of that ever came out none of that was ever ever came out and largely because um, it didn't come out because all the evidence was stolen back from him by the cops by him and the cops. He he had me arrested. Where I I'll link I'll link some of these. These are all story time videos because there's so many great stories um, about when he set me up to get me arrested just so that he could get the evidence back of all this stuff that I had found. This pay dirt of like crazy paperwork that he had generated. You know, oddly enough, the one sympathetic gesture he made to me when I had the heart attack was that I should take some time off from work. I should take some time off and, you know, don't worry about coming to the office. How generous of him, right? Anyways, um, so I am disabled, penniless, homeless, you name it. And so I am calling my brother from jail, from the you know, phone that any of you ever have any interactions with jail, it's like, you know, you take this call from this inmate. I mean, it is just, you know. I have no, I have no, I mean, I didn't have a lot of pride to begin with, but I have no pride left. I mean, there's just, I mean, I asked him, and, it, and that really was, probably was one of the most humbling things I've ever had to do because I had been really betrayed, really betrayed by him. And to be now at, having no other choice than to ask him for a favor. I mean, there were other choices. There's always another choice, but my other choices were pretty bad. My other choice really was like going to prison. It was really my only other choice. Um, and so, um, so you know, I was up against going to prison. So I asked my brother if I could come live with him. And having no compassion and no sympathy whatsoever, no empathy whatsoever, being completely heartless, he says, you're asking me to invite addiction into my home. That's what he said. And I go, uh, well, no, I'm asking you to invite your sister into your home. You know, talk about, 
talk about depersonalizing a person, you know, talking about like, you know, breaking a person down into, you know, I mean, how badly did they want this definition for me? You know what I mean? That that's all I was anymore was this, you know, it's so clear no one really even believed it because there was nothing they were doing that was supportive of any kind of recovery. There was, and if, 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 you know, knowing, knowing what I do about addiction, which is a lot, um, there is no way that there was ever any, anyone who thought that I was an addict that would have said to do what they were doing. So the two things just didn't go together. And, um, and, and it certainly didn't go together with wanting the, what was best for, it, it, what was in the best interest of my sons or myself, but certainly not my sons. I mean, there was nothing in what anyone was doing that was in my son's best interest or in mine. But anyways, he did, um, he did go ahead and let me come there and he was super superior the whole time and I had to, that now all of a sudden I, my, I had to be supervised with my sons, you know. And so my ex would love to hold, and my, and my brother loved to, you know, hold this over me. Yet they'd leave and leave me babysitting his kids all the time. You know, it was just, it was absolutely ludicrous. So I got a little with my brother and I tell this another story, but eventually what ends up happening is that the court decides that I would be safer in jail than at my brother's house. So for another video to see why that happens. So, you know, there's no chance to, you know, I have to go right immediately right that day. So I don't get a chance to even say goodbye to my kids. But my court orders say that there be liberal phone, phone contact. But for, and so I, I'm in jail for three months. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm in jail for six months. But for three of those months, I'm completely in jail. And for the last three months, I'm on work release so I can leave jail. And so for three months, I can't get a hold of my kids. He won't answer the phone. And so I finally, when I get, when I get on work release, I make a beeline to, um, to the school to, to see my kids. And the teacher, my son's fourth grade teacher stood there and was just, her jaw just dropped. And, um, I, I didn't know. And believe me, it was a, it was a very stressful thing to go there. He had moved them, he, against court orders again, he had moved them to a whole new school. He'd taken them out of school, moved them into a whole new school, and, and told them that their mother was dead. Of course, I don't know this yet. But, um, but I go there and I, I see my kids and they're thrilled to see me. I see my niece, she's thrilled to see me. And, um, but the teacher tells me, the teacher pulls me aside, she's like, uh, I have to tell you that I'm stunned to see you because uh, uh, Noah told Noah's been in counseling since he came here because he said his mother was had died, and she said every time they did like a project about draw your family or something like that, he would just break down in tears. I was just shocked. I didn't say anything to Noah. Noah seemed fine, and he didn't say anything to me either about it. And and Liam never said anything to me about it, never. And uh, but I know it's true because I called their dad, and um, I confronted him about you know not answering the phone and all this stuff and what's been going on. And um, and I said, did you tell the kids that I was saying? He's like. Yeah, I did. And the reason I picked up the phone, it was just easier, you know? Basically what it was is that he had decided that I was dead, basically. He decided this was it, that he was, that I was done for. The whole family decided that because of this thing that I had done, I was just like, I should go be, have a life in prison, I guess. And um, that basically I, I, was, I was as good as dead. I was out of the kid's life, I was as good as dead. And so, and they, they no longer had to, you know, I don't know. They just treated me like I was like I was dead, and so he, they thought of me as though I was dead. And so, and of course, what's super creepy about it is, is that in two thousand and one, I, I did, I did die technically die and had to be resuscitated. And so I swear it was as though he got in his head right then what he wanted. It was like all of a sudden this light went on for him, and he thought, oh, 
here's the ticket. I could, um, not, I could like get a fresh start with someone who doesn't know anything about my old past. I could like have our life and they could just, I could tell whatever story I wanted to about it. And I wouldn't have to give away half the credit, half, and I wouldn't have to share any of it. And I could get all this sympathy because I would be a widower. And, you know, I mean, I could just create this whole story. Because the next person I know doesn't have to know my story. She knows my story. She knows I didn't have anything when we met. And, you know, I wouldn't have to have any of that humiliation anymore. Now I could have someone who doesn't, doesn't know, who I don't know, owe anything and doesn't know anything about me. And so that's what I want. I want out. And I, you know, he never wanted a divorce. He wanted that. He wanted, he wanted what he would get if I was dead. And so that became the goal was was to if he didn't if he could if i didn't die which he was really sincerely hoping i would and even um even even uh i am fairly certain uh i was told was looking into finding ways to make sure that i was i was gone but you know he was certainly was hope, hoping that I would either my heart would act up again or I would commit suicide or I would just run away or disappear or get locked up in an insane asylum or I don't know what he but he was definitely hoping that I would off myself or be offed somehow forever and that's pretty much what he had in his mind in his mind none of in none of their minds did they ever th were they thinking that I was going to be around and living and um, and just going on with life and being okay. And in, you know, they, they just thought I was, they, they were done with me and I was going to be gone. And in their minds, and so he didn't, you know, like I said, he didn't want a divorce. He didn't want to, he didn't want to go through a divorce and, you know, pay child support and divide up the assets equitably and all that. No, he wanted, he wanted what he would get if I was dead. And so he wasn't settling for anything short of that. And he basically just about got that. It, it may be even, possibly even better than that because, um, because he was really able to create a bunch of drama, which he loved. And, um, and he was able to, you know, really make, uh, make me, you know, with my help, make me look really bad with my parents' help and with my help. And we all helped him out to, you know, I was a, I was a, I was his best accomplice for sure. I was his best accomplice because I was, um, so trusting and I was so, um, such a wreck. I mean, you know, just anyways. So, so yeah, so he tells me he, that I, he told me that, that I was, he told, he, he confessed that it was true that he said, yeah, I did. They were crying every night and it was just, you know, it was like better for them just to not, just to think you were, just to believe that you were gone. I don't, I don't know what to what else to do about it but my son doesn't say anything to me for three years and finally when he starts having there starts to be trouble trouble starts around seventh grade and that was the year that um my husband met his now wife and at the same time my son also started seeing this uh girl his first and really only significant relationship very destructive relationship codependent relationship um with the person that had no conscience and yeah um and um and he he starts the the the, the normal kid the living off of resilience and just uh, lasted up it through sixth grade, but seventh grade we started seeing trouble and um, grades dropped and all that. And that's when, like, first sense of depression started. And that's when he said to me, um, "How could, how could, how could somebody do that? How could a father do that to their child? How could he tell me that my mother was dead?" And he started kind of breaking down about it. And so we talked about it, and um, and you know, I. I you know, I, I don't know. I'm really, I'm so sorry that that happened, and you know, um, but yeah. So it took him, it took him a few years, and that same seventh grade year or so, him saying something about 
my ex say something about needing to get the kids a new mother. And I said, uh, they have a mother. And he said, well, yeah, but you know, what, what, you know, if I get married again, you know, I'm like, then, then you'll have a new wife and they'll have a stepmother, but they have a mother, but it wasn't registering in his mind. I was in his mind. I was out. I was inconsequential. I was dead to him. And it, it was completely, I was completely dead to him. And when he strikes out again at me in the, when he goes out for custody, it's clear that that's the case because he hasn't kept up with, he hasn't kept up to speed. He treats me as though it's going to be just as easy as it was the first time, as though I'm just as vulnerable and just as helpless and just as, um, you know, he hasn't paid any attention to all the changes that I've made and, and the, he hasn't paid any attention to my life at all. I'm just completely inconsequential to him. You know, it's like I don't even exist anymore. Until he gets with this wife, this new woman, who, you know, they need drama, A, and B, she just, you know, I'm someone that she can come and be divisive with and, and all that. So, um, so her, you know, her, her one of her big focuses is on, um, you know, befriending my family and, and getting rid of me. And so even though I am just, I have no interest in them and their life at all. You know, I'm just no, no problem for them at all. I, you know, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I stay out of, I stay out of their whole way. I'm just, I am trying to just fly under the radar screen and get my kids through their childhood with as much peace as possible and as little time, as little conflict with their dad as possible and um, as much time with me that they can heal and grow up as possible. So yeah, that's the kind of thing that I think you can count on from a sociopath. That's what it's like when you are when you are co-parenting co with a sociopath. Thanks a lot. Come back. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.